Thank you, Dario. Thank you uh, for uh, op uh, offering this great opportunity for, I think, for everybody, for the audience, uh, for uh, for us as uh, scholars uh, to hear from uh, for our colleagues, uh, Professor Nikolai Petro, a very uh, uh, stimulating, insightful. Uh, uh, conference, which is in some way the continuation, the further evolution of the previous one, because part of the title is the same, the tragedy of Ukraine. But uh, actually, the first part that is connected uh, was connected also to his uh, uh, research that he is doing here in uh, uh, in Bologna, despite this unfortunate time, is uh, related to, to the uh, Greek uh, tragedy and what this Greek tragedy, classical Greek tragedy, can teach us about the conflict resolution. And now we are entering to the question of conflict, nationalism versus patriotism. I mean, this is the topic of the lecture today, and uh, you know very well this is a very, uh, very uh, timely topic uh, because tensions uh, are accumulating along the borders between Ukraine and Russia, and so uh, the United States also uh, took part in this uh, quarrel, uh, uh, at least for the moment, uh, mainly verbal, but anyhow not, uh, by the way, not uh, uh, so so uh, dangerous as we can uh, imagine perspective. Well, so this is very great uh, opportunity to discuss these issues with a great specialist of Russian Ukraine. Professor uh, Petro is uh, currently our visiting professor at our Institute for Advanced Studies and cooperating with the Department of Political and Social Science. But he is also full professor, he's mainly a full professor in political science at the University of Rhode Island. He was previously a member of the Sylvia Chandley Professorship of Peace Studies and Nonviolence in the same university. He has published uh, several studies and books uh, on, uh, uh, on Russia. And uh, what we can also say, uh, he uh, also uh, is an active uh, intellectual in the so-called uh, third mission, we say, because he uh, extensively uh, has published uh, on uh, several uh, uh, magazines like uh, the International New York Times, The Guardian, The Kiev Post, The Moscow Times, The Nation, National Interest, and so on and so forth. Uh, he has been also the special assistant for policy in the U.S. State Department during the George Bush administration, and uh, uh, is uh, it has been uh, recently invited to join the board of directors of the American Committee for U.S.-Russian Accord, which is a, a sort of successor of the previously existing American Committee for East-West Accords. It was revived in 2015 by Stephen Cohen, Cohen who died recently, and also among the prominent scholars, in addition to Petro, there are other scholars like Jack Matlock Jr. and others who belong to this very important uh, think tank. Uh, think tank. So I would like to thank very much Professor Petro for uh, being here with us. And uh, uh, well, welcome. And we are very uh, interested and curious to hear from your presentation how is uh, the situation of uh, nationalism versus patriotism in Ukraine today in this very, uh, very problematic present. Thank you, and the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dario and Stefano, uh, for the chance to uh, resume our discussion about Ukraine. Hopefully this time, I'd like to focus more in detail on the policy aspect of what I talked about before, is more of a theoretical framework for understanding events in Ukraine. At the end of my previous talk, I mentioned that I view the crisis in Ukraine in the same way that Thucydides viewed the Peloponnesian War, as a long suicide of the polity. I called it tragic because I define tragedy as an outcome made inescapable 
by the fact that the actors do not see how their own actions are leading to the very outcome they wish to avoid. And this, of course, implies that if the actors ever did recognize this, the tragic cycle could be broken. Such blindness is not unusual. Throughout history, the failure of ideology has been masked by revolutionary fervor. The value of tragedy is that it rips away these masks and reveals the brutal consequences of ignoring reality. <clears throat> it does so, as Raymond Williams points out, by engaging the body politic, quote, in such a way that the underlying disorder becomes apparent and terrible in overtly tragic ways. From the whole experience of this disorder and through its specific actions, order is recreated, end quote. To me, this summarizes what Ukraine is now going through. The disorder of 2014 and 2015 is giving birth to a new order in which millions of Russian speakers, the other Ukrainians, as I call them, no longer have a place. To understand why this is so, we need to discuss nationalism, patriotism, and their relationship to policy. Democracy's greatest benefit, as I see it, is that it can serve as a check on the imagination of rulers. When this check fails, policies fail. Economic policy becomes not about creating wealth, but about puffing up the national ego. Cultural management becomes not about balancing diversity and unity, but about eliminating the need for balance by eliminating competing views. And national security becomes not about promoting the national interest in an interdependent world, but about portraying these interests as the struggle of good against evil. When it is overlaid onto a divided political and cultural matrix, such as that of Ukraine, nationalism promotes a vicious cycle that undermines national unity. It is a characteristic of nationalist regimes that rather than adjust their policies to the needs of the populace, they redouble their ideological commitment. This insistence on ideological purity, even when it causes visible harm to society and self, is part of what George Orwell called the mental habits of nationalism. These habits have been prominently on display recently in Ukraine's efforts to obtain a vaccine against COVID-19. <clears throat> the Ukrainian government's vaccination efforts illustrate all the core ideological motifs of nationalism. First, that the enemy other, in this case Russia, is deemed incompetent and therefore destined to fail. Second, the enemy other is labeled duplicitous, so that any apparent benevolence must be a lie. Third, any assertion to the contrary is defined as treason. The tone was set by the American embassy in Kiev, which on October 13th last year, summoned Health Minister Maxim Stepanov after he seemed to suggest that Ukraine would purchase any vaccine approved by the World Health Organization, even Russia's. After this meeting, the embassy stated on behalf of the minister that, quote, Ukraine will not be buying Russia's COVID vaccine, which has not passed clinical trials for safety, exclamation point, end quote. After that, both health minister Stepanov and the head of the 
Ukrainian Parliament's Committee for Health and Medicine, Mikhail Radutsky, took the tack that no Russian vaccine existed. Moreover, discussions about purchasing it were moot since, quote, the World Health Organization would not purchase Sputnik V under any circumstances, end quote. In December 2020, opposition politician Viktor Medvedchuk, a close friend of Russian President Vladimir Putin, found a way around this by reaching a tentative agreement for the production of Sputnik V in Ukraine. This proposal, however, was also rejected. As Ukraine's foreign minister, Dmitry Kuleba, put it, even if it were effective, Sputnik V would not be used in Ukraine because, quote, Russia is not interested in the health of Ukrainians, but in imposing its propaganda and its ideology, end quote. By early January 2021, therefore, Ukraine had reached an agreement with just one supplier, the Chinese firm Sinovac Biotech, to provide enough doses to vaccinate roughly two to five million people. In addition, the government said, it had pledges from the World Health Organization's COVAX consortium for several million more as yet unnamed vaccines to be delivered at a later date. Scandal erupted later that month when the head of the National Medical Chamber of Ukraine, Sergei Kravchenko, who also directs the country's leading vaccine institute, declared that there were no actual contracts. As he explained it, the two competing Ukrainian purchasing agencies had only agreed between themselves on what to purchase, but that Sinovac Biotech had not actually agreed to supply anything. When this became known, thanks to the investigative reporting of Channel 112, which was subsequently taken off the air, the government decided to outsource its vaccine purchasing to the British firm Crown Agents. Thanks to its efforts, it was soon announced that 12 million doses of the Covishield and Novavax vaccines had been purchased from the Serum Institute in India, with whom Crown Agents has a long-standing relationship. This, however, led to another minor scandal when journalists pointed out that in 2008, the Serum Institute had produced an experimental vaccine against rubella and measles, whose use in Ukraine had to be suspended. In an effort to find a way out of this morass, on January 20th, 2021, the Rada decided that a vaccine approved in the USA, India, or any EU country could automatically be accepted in Ukraine. This, however, became problematic the very next day when Hungary approved the use of Sputnik V. On February 8th, therefore, the cabinet of ministers of Ukraine specifically prohibited the registration in Ukraine of any Russian anti-COVID vaccine or any prophylactic medicine, apparently unaware that at the time, 90% of Ukraine's PCR COVID tests came from Russia. On February 2nd, the British medical journal The Lancet published the results of the third round of clinical trials of Sputnik V. Despite its general positive assessment, however, Minister Stepanov continued to insist that, quote, no one believed in the vaccine's effectiveness. Then, to add insult to injury, the National Anti-Corruption Bureau and the Specialized Anti-Corruption Prosecutor of Ukraine both opened criminal investigations into the Ministry of Health for approving the purchase of the Sinovac vaccine despite its low effectiveness and exorbitant price. Minister Stepanov accused them of lacking patriotism and of trying to force Ukraine to purchase Sputnik V. He warned that this would result in a sneak Russian attack 
on the Ukrainian military weakened by its lack of vaccination. Having failed to obtain any vaccines by his own deadline of February 15th, Stepanov flew to India to take personal possession of 500,000 doses of the Covishield vaccine that had been hastily arranged by the heretofore unknown intermediary firm, Grace of God, for $56.7 million. It is unclear, however, whether this amount was paid only for the initial shipment or for all 12 million doses mentioned in the press. Since on February 19th, the Ministry of Health prohibited the release of all information regarding the producer, suppliers, or prices of vaccines. In any case, a month later, India suspended all vaccine shipments to Ukraine. This was done partly in order to provide more vaccines to its own population, and partly, according to the head of the Rada's Committee on Health and Medicine, because of the, quote, defamatory statements about India as a manufacturer of medicines, quote, that had been made by leading Ukrainian politicians. Meanwhile, the Sinovac vaccine that Ukraine had originally purchased began to arrive in late March, but only one-tenth as many doses as expected. As a result, Health Minister Stepanov declared that the time between the first and second shots of the vaccine would be extended from three weeks to 12 weeks in order, as he put it, to increase its effectiveness. As of this writing, according to the government's official tracking site, over 385,000 people nationwide have received their first dose of the vaccine and five the second. Because Ukraine's vaccine saga unfolded in such a short amount of time, we can trace the application of nationalism to policy and understand how it led Ukraine to become the last country in Europe to begin mass vaccination. The arguments against Russia's vaccine shifted so rapidly that their ideological nature became impossible to hide. First, the vaccine did not exist, then it was not effective, then it would probably be poisoned, finally it would never be registered. When Vice Premier Mikhail Reznikov referred to the COVID mortality rate in the rebel-held regions of Donbass as, quote, medical genocide, end quote, then two weeks later claimed that administering Sputnik V in the region to combat it was a, quote, war crime, it fit the pattern nicely. Forcing government policy into the narrow ideological framework of getting as far away from Russia as possible, not only prevented the Ukrainian government from developing a realistic assessment of the country's chances of getting a vaccine anywhere else. It also multiplied the government's internal political difficulties. The fact that Minister Stepanov changed his mind about Sputnik V right after visiting the American embassy, and Ukraine's decision to sanction Chinese companies in the midst of delicate negotiations for the Sinovac vaccine reinforced the popular perception that the Ukrainian government is totally under the thumb of the United States. When opposition leader Viktor Medvedchuk tried to arrange for the Russian vaccine to be produced in Ukraine, this obviously served his political agenda as well. But the government's dismissal of his efforts encouraged the view that it would rather sacrifice Ukrainian lives than compromise with the political opposition and no doubt, this contributed to President Zelensky's steep decline in popularity in early 2021. Ukraine's vaccine debacle may be a particularly egregious example 
of the ideological blinders that nationalism imposes on policy, but it is not atypical. In my book, I look at how the same pattern has unfolded in foreign policy, economic policy, and cultural policy. Despite repeated clamorous policy failures, the government has consistently reaffirmed its ideological commitment to nationalism rather than adjust its policy. Social scientists who insist that policymaking can be divorced from cultural considerations will find this disturbing. It calls into question their assumption that human beings act to maximize self-interest, which is driven largely, though not exclusively, by material benefit. But if one considers culture to be also a factor in policymaking, then a more hopeful prospect emerges. Namely, if one set of cultural values leads to policies that disrupt social harmony, then replacing it with an alternative set of cultural values could lead to policies that promote social, that promote social harmony and thereby <clears throat> disrupt the tragic cycle. The surprising alternative that I wish to propose for your consideration is patriotism, the most effective, but also the least known antidote to nationalism. As I mentioned, Tragedy results when by trying to correct an injustice, we unwittingly perpetuate. By definition, nationalists see the dominance of others over the core nation as unjust and try to correct this injustice by reversing the situation. In the nationalistic version of social solidarity, therefore, justice, and the exclusion of minorities are linked. Relegated to second-class citizenship, the minority can do little but nurture resentment and plot revenge. The triumph of nationalism can thus reliably be counted on to feed the tragic cycle. This standard view of nationalism has spawned two counter reactions. Cosmopolitanism, which argues that the corruption inherent in nationalism makes it irredeemable. And the second, liberal nationalism, which seeks to save nationalism from its own worst impulse by harnessing it to liberal institutions. Both of these alternatives are deemed unconvincing. And this has led to pessimism among students of nationalism about the prospects for liberal society. But I suggest that such pessimi pessimism is based on a faulty premise, the conflation of nationalism with patriotism. This is an error common to both cosmopolitans who argue that patriotism merely disguises nationalism's inherent destructiveness, as well as liberal nationalists who see the patriots' love of hearth and home as entirely natural and say that nationalism is merely the same thing on a larger scale. The reason for this confusion is easy to understand. Patriotism's distinctiveness has been entirely swallowed up by the nation state. If we want the civic component of democracy to be more than just an extension of the nation state, then we must remember what made patriotism different from nationalism in the first place. Both patriotism and nationalism involve love of, identification with, and special concern for a specific entity. In the case of patriotism, that entity is one's patria or homeland. In the case of nationalism, that entity is one's natio or birthplace. 
often also one's place of origin in an ethnic cultural sense. It seems natural to think of the two as overlapping, but when a polity is ethnically, culturally, or religiously diverse, patriotism and nationalism often part ways. Mary G. Dietz traces the origins of the term patria to ancient Greece, where it referred not to territory at all, but to participation in the life of the polis. Subsequently, in the Roman Empire, two patriae coexisted, the individual city, patria sua, and Rome, the common fatherland, or communis patria. From the very outset, John H. Shaw reminds us, attachment to patria was thus profoundly municipal, even domestic. With the rise of Christianity, one's patria could be spiritual as well as political. While the latter was rooted in the urbis, the former had the universal connotation of the orbis, with the Pope connecting the two in his capacity as pontifex maximus, or great bridge builder. At times, the two were in harmony, as described by Emperor Justinian in his sixth novella, and at times in conflict as described by St. Augustine of Hippo in his book, The City of God. The term is not widely adopted in English, however, until the 16th century, when it meant a person who took his stand with country, or more exactly with the constitution, and against absolutist kings. Throughout the 18th century, then, a patriot was someone whose rights derived from a particular set of constitutional and political principles, a free republic, the love of liberty, the sanctity of property, and above all, limited government. These principles derived not from the territory upon which one lived, but from the spirit and strength of the nation. Well into the 19th century, says Dietz, in England, the term patriotism connoted opposition to the centralized state and to the rise of capitalism. But as the nation becomes the supreme object of political loyalty and the state the embodiment of the nation, patriotism is recast as duty and service to the state. And the need for direct civil engagement apart from the state seems superfluous. The inherent conflict between patriotic and nationalistic ways of thinking about politics was understood from the first. Tracing nationalism's usage back to 1844, the Oxford English Dictionary tells us that it was first described as, quote, another word for egotism, end quote. In today's situation of total nation state dominance of political discourse, many view the attempt to reclaim patriotism as hopeless. The rise of the nation state may be regrettable as Ernest Gellner, Anthony Smith and others have argued, but in modern society, it is a fait accompli. There are simply no longer any political roles for patria to play without national boundaries. The Alma Mater Studiorum's own alumnus, Maurizio Viroli, is one of the few who disagrees. He suggests that rediscovering the original meaning of patriotism could shift civic identity or citizenship from the nation state back to the community, thus restoring the traditional link between locality and politics that made it civic. For patriots, says Viroli, citizenship always meant, quote, the enjoyment and exercise of civil and political rights as a member of a respublica or civitas, 
which is primarily a political community established to allow the individuals to live together in justice and liberty under the protection of the law, end quote. Patriotic citizenship thus requires a shift from a cultural to an explicitly civic identity, which is precisely why, Biroli notes, so many early nationalists repudiated republicanism. Nationalism values above all the cultural, religious, and ethnic unity of a people. Whereas patriotism values above all the people's common liberty enshrined in the ideals of equality before the law. The history of 20th century Europe shows us the disastrous turn that nationalism can take when it is mistaken for patriotism. Restoring the original meaning of patriotism would thus be a powerful antidote to nationalism. What Viroli proposes, in essence, is a patriotism divorced from nationalism, one in which political unity is based on the Republican commitment to the common good rather than on cultural, religious, or ethnic homogeneity. <clears throat> Let us go back for a second to the origins. For the Greeks, patriotism or civic activism went hand in hand with the cultivation of compassion. The Peloponnesian War, according to Richard Ned Lebo, is the story of how the Greeks lost compassion and how it led to the loss of social harmony. In their frenzy for war, the Greeks became inarticulate and unable to access the rational thought needed for communal deliberation. Thucydides, the great historian of that conflict, hoped that his work would serve as, quote, a grammar to aid in the reconstruction of the language of politics, end quote. How realistic is it to believe that the same could be done in our own frenzied societies today? It would first be necessary to explain the benefits of restoring the historical distinction between nationalism and patriotism. And I'd like to list several of them for you. One is that it undermines the fanaticism of ethnic nationalism by shifting the primary loyalty of citizens to institutions and practices that promote pluralism. The founding fathers of the Italian resurgence, il risorgimento, Giuseppe Mazzini, Carlo Cattaneo, and others, consistently warned that attempts to build a nation through the fusion of national identity rather than on the freedom of local communities would lead only to mutual hatred and divorce. A second benefit is that patriotism is deeply skeptical of big government. This derives from its premise that the values of the state have moral validity only if they are universal. Thus, no patriot could ever say, quote, my country right or wrong, says G.K. Chesterton, that would be like saying, my mother, drunk or sober. The Patriots' version of loyalty, Ziller Talk suggests, would instead be something like, my country for the values it realizes. Traditionally, Patriots have deemed this to be a crucial difference. Nationalism, they charge, does not derive values from universal principles but from a unique form of belonging and way of life. They are therefore perfectly willing to sacrifice the former for the latter. While patriotism derives its value from the same wellspring, both the people, places, and ways that nurture us, these alone cannot justify loyalty to the polity. That loyalty rests on the principles set forth in a covenant or constitution which must give primacy to shared interests 
over parochial in identities. The primacy of shared interest must be deemed universal and supreme, for without it, no human community is possible. The, patri the Patriots' deep skepticism of the state is thus, says Igor Primorats, quote, a stance of disloyalty grounded in a deeper loyalty, end quote, a loyalty to humanity. A third benefit of patriotism is that it promotes civic solidarity. This flows from the following syllogism. <clears throat> One, freedom is an intrinsic good. Two, upholding freedom in society is a collective enterprise that increases the dependence of citizens upon each other. Three, patriotism, patriotism turns this abstract dependence into action, making it a strong and reliable social bond. Such social commitment does not arise spontaneously, but from civic education. Civic education can wean citizens away from nationalism while leading them to further civic activism. For Jürgen Habermas, Forming the democratic will of the polity alongside the individual's recognition of his own personal role in it is an essential process for any polity that wishes to develop what he called constitutional patriotism. While Habermas emphasizes the rationality of promoting a common civic identity, Simone Weil returns to the Greeks to argue that it is equally important for a republic to foster compassion. They saw alienation as stemming from the individual's inability to find meaningful roots in modernity. Nations should therefore help to reestablish these roots and then to expand them into a broad and interconnecting network of civic ties to which individuals could feel a sense of belonging. A patriotism built on feelings of mutual compassion, she felt, <clears throat> would have the added benefit of allowing citizens to raise their own country's flaws without immediately being branded as traitors. A final benefit of patriotism is that it is peaceful. Orwell insists that patriotism is, quote, of its nature defensive, both militarily and culturally, end quote. It is true that 18th century English Republicans were mostly hostile to the excesses of colonialism and tended to support the claims of the American settlers against the British crown. A century later, the so-called Little Englanders, men like Chesterton, William Morris, Ernest Belford, Bax, C.F.G. Masterman, and J.A. Hobson, went much further and made anti-imperialism and opposition to the Boer War the heart of their campaign for a new patriotism. Quote, what we really need for the frustration and overthrow of a deaf and raucous jingoism, Chesterton wrote, is a renaissance of the love of the native land, end quote, by which he meant specifically a return to the city patriotism of ancient Greece. At first glance, it would seem that a revival of patriotism is only to be welcomed but skeptics have raised a number of concerns. The most important is that there is no real difference between nationalism and patriotism. Most of what passes as patriotism in common parlance, says Michael Hector, are instances of state building nationalism, which means the two are now interchangeable. A second objection is that while the objects of devotion for patriots, nationalists, and cosmopolitans may not be the same, it is not clear why any of them should be inherently less prone to violence 
At the same time that patriotism is forging bonds of solidarity among some, it is also forging divisions between the friends and the enemies of the Republic. Patriotism is therefore just as likely as nationalism to lead to civil war and ruin because, as Michael Ignatiev reminds us, countries are contested places. Patriotism's critics also like to stress that the nation should not be viewed as a mere ideological construct. In fact, it is drawn together by people who have an emotional attachment to the territory they consider to be home. Borders are not derived from principles of liberty or democracy, says Faith Bader, but from primordial attachments that are far more tangible to actual feelings. Others see a problem in trying to translate an emotional attachment for a particular culture into an emotional attachment for all humanity. Viroli argues that it is precisely because love for one's personal liberty is so pronounced that it, quote, easily extends beyond national borders and translates into solidarity, end quote. But then how does it differ from messianism, a criticism often leveled at the doctrine of American exceptionalism? Char's assertion that patriotism is more peaceful than nationalism because, quote, patriots do not comfortably support wars of expansion or wars of principle, end quote, conveniently ignores that they routinely do, in fact, support such wars. Finally, there is the argument that even if a distinction between patriotism and nationalism were both valid and applicable, it is no longer practical. What these critics object to is the absence of institutions for the formation of a patriotic public. Patriotism's advocates stress the importance of education and argue that a proper civic education will promote compassion and social solidarity which will then somehow be transmuted into sentiments and actions that sustain liberty. Bader ridicules this argument as the social science equivalent of alchemy. The critics of the revival of patriotism raised several valid concerns, but none of them seem devastating to me. Moreover, they too tend to oversimplify. For example, the argument that there is no discernible distinction between patriotism and nationalism simply ignores history. The argument that drawing a distinction between them today is senseless because of the preeminence of the nation state overlooks the ability of educational and informational policies to alter public perception. Finally, the argument that a renewal of patriotism without nationalism would be pointless without new institutions institutions already in place surely puts the cart before the horse. Societies must first recognize that they have lost social harmony and yearn for its restoration, a process the Greeks referred to as anagnorisis, before thinking about the kinds of institutions needed to uphold it. For patriots, therefore, the first practical step to restoring social harmony would probably be to shift the locus of politics from the nation state to the local community. The second would be to avoid parochialism and foster national unity by promoting the love of liberty under the law. Their agenda was summed up by the 19th century Italian patriot Carlo Cattaneo. Quote, communities are the nation, the most intimate refuge of the nation and its liberty, end quote. <clears throat> All forms of patriotism and nationalism have in common an appeal to identity and values, for these are powerful sentiments for mobilizing a community. But while nationalism mobilizes through an exclusive definition of who belongs, in which civic identity is made 
commensurate with its ethnicity and culture, patriotism mobilizes through an inclusive definition of who belongs, in which civic identity is kept distinct from ethnicity and culture. Patriotism is inclusive because it is based on criteria that can be chosen. Nationalism is exclusive because it is based on criteria that are inherent. For a nationalism that is rooted in ethnicity and race, the principles of exclusion are clear. But what about culture, which is obviously chosen? Nationalism strives to take that choice away from the individual because it fears that cultural pluralism will lead to disloyalty. Patriotism, while it may not welcome cultural pluralism, is not frightened of it because it sees loyalty as rooted in civic rather than cultural identity. This distinction is relevant to Ukraine which, to put it simply, is relying on nationalism to unite society when it might be better off relying on patriotism. The exclusive ethnic and cultural forms of solidarity touted by Ukrainian nationalists can only cultivate resentment that will lead to a new cycle of tragic vengeance. Whereas, at its best, Ukrainian patriotism promotes pluricultural and inclusive forms of social solidarity that could eventually allow the other Ukrainians to become stakeholders in the social order. The choice of which of these two models of social solidarity to follow, nationalistic or patriotic, will determine how long Ukraine's tragic cycle is to endure. Well, thank you very much. I uh, look forward to your questions and comments.